First of all, we'd like to express our gratitude for the interest that you've shown by your presence and for your participation in these activities, uh, which give us a much broader view of the Civil War and the period thereafter than we've had in years prior to this. There's been an opportunity and an effort to broaden the perspective and to bring in uh, testimonies and uh, positions that have been overlooked in the past. Uh, and we're grateful for that. Uh, we're grateful to uh, Dr. Matthews for that really outstanding uh, presentation. Uh, and it was right on target. <laughs> and portions of it I know from my own experience <laughs> uh, that it was. Um, I want to thank uh, Speaker Howell and his wife for being here and honoring us with their presence along with other dignitaries. Now, I'm not going through the names of all the dignitaries because I'd have to probably call every name in here, but uh, we're grateful for that. Um, my discussion uh, should include um, the movement and its activities since my coming here. And I might say to you that I came to Fredericksburg in 1962. Uh, the public movement for change became visible, I think, uh, after the 1954 uh, school desegregation decision and after protests, student protests, uh, had begun uh, around several colleges uh, across the nation. Before we arrived here in 1962, several protests had taken place downtown by young people who had been counseled by Mrs. Gladys Todd and supported by the local NAACP. I mentioned Mrs. Todd's name because she was very strict about counseling the young people that you can't fight back. They were sitting in at the uh, the rest, rest, well, there was the, actually the, the uh, drugstore, the pharmacy, had a lunch counter downtown. And of course, uh, not everyone welcomed them with open arms when they came to sit in. Uh, and there was an attempt to uh, upset them, some by pouring drinks on the, their, over their heads, uh, by insulting them, and by other means of attack. Uh, but Mrs. Todd kept reminding them that the success of that protest uh, weighted on their shoulders because they had to have the courage not to fight back. And I, I, I'm hearing this theme again as I hear about uh, the, the picture that's coming out, 42. Uh, about uh, Jackie Robinson, who is breaking into professional uh, baseball. And they told him in, in that picture, you have to have the courage not to fight back when they attack you, but you have to have the courage not to fight back. Uh, and once again, uh, this approach, this nonviolent approach, came to the people in this area as they did all over the nation by virtue of the, uh, the philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King, uh, that you had to love your neighbor because you're going to have to deal with that neighbor uh, after this was all over. And if you go forward with an eye for an eye and a tooth for tooth, you're going to have a blind, toothless society. Uh, but at any rate, uh, the, uh, these uh, uh, sit-ins had taken place uh, and they had had some minor uh, effect, but not overwhelming. Uh, James Monroe, by that time, 
uh, had been forced to desegregate as a result of legal action. And I might say here that one of the students of color uh, who were the first to attend James Monroe became the circuit court judge for this district, uh, Judge John Scott. Uh, his work with the NAACP led him on occasion, on at least one occasion that I'm aware of, to argue his case before the United States Supreme Court. He was a very dedicated jurist uh, and a very dedicated person. Uh, desegregation gains had been minor at that point, but people are aware of the mood across the nation and the desire for change uh, was in their hearts even here in the Fredericksburg area. When I came, Fredericksburg ministers had a change on their agenda. Uh, their organization was separate from those in the surrounding counties. And when I arrived, they had already decided to invite me to join their association. Their meetings were primarily held in churches where my presence wouldn't be a problem. But they also sought to have some meetings with meals at local businesses. And this was where my presence would provide a quiet serving of a non-white customer and in a sense, to their some degree, uh, a desegregation uh, of these facilities. At least they would say, well, the, 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 the place didn't collapse when he came in. <laughs> and so we may be able to accommodate a few more uh, to come in subsequent to that. Uh, but I, I will always continue to remember uh, that the changes that took place uh, when I first came, that I was a part of, came as a result of these ministers and their dedication to the proposition that the Christian and Jewish community, because at that time, the Jewish rabbi was a member of the Ministerial Association, uh, had a responsibility uh, to give a witness to what Christ would have done uh, in this community had he been the leader at that time. Uh, so they, one of the ways that they did go about trying to bring about changes uh, was to uh, have joint services where members of our different churches would have the opportunity of coming together uh, and get to know each other just a little bit and maybe form fellowships. Uh, and uh, this would be a step in the right direction. Uh, now, all of the churches uh, were wanting to be a part of this, but not all of their members wanted to be a part of this. Uh, one local church, and I guess I better not, I won't, give the name of the denomination of the church. One of the local churches split as a result of the minister accepting uh, a black uh, member in that congregation. Uh, and uh, a part of that church left and formed another church uh, in this area. So that there was a division of thinking among the people, but the ministers themselves were leading in the right direction, uh, even though it affected their personalities, I mean their, their popularity in some cases. Now, uh, I became a part of things, uh, partly because in the black community, it's not altogether different now. Uh, the minister has some uh, leeway and some leverage that the average person does not have. First of all, the black church, uh, well, first of all, during the time when they were trying to bring about change, one of the ways that change was uh, hindered was when somebody in the community uh, 
uh, tried to bring about change or they stirred up something, uh, they would lose their jobs. Uh, persons who had uh, bank uh, notes would find out that suddenly that note became due. Uh, and so it was not, there was, there was not a great deal of enthusiasm about putting themselves in this situation. Now, the black pastor was different. His salary is not, was paid by his congregation. And nobody from the outside uh, is going to put enough pressure in a, as a Baptist church on all of them the members, that they will exclude the back baptism. Uh, the church uh, belonged to the membership. So the bank couldn't close, foreclose on the church. And the church uh, officers were not going to fire the minister. So the one who had the most freedom in the community was the black minister. Uh, now, with that comes responsibility. They know that you have that leeway, that leverage, and so they want to put it to use. One of the first things that they told me was that you're going to be the um, president of the PTA in Fredericksburg. Well, in some of the counties, ministers were on the, uh, a part of the school system. They had gotten jobs there, so they were vulnerable. And so I didn't have an opportunity to become a part of the school system here because they didn't want that vulnerability. I was under the impression for a while that this was going to not be an option but a necessity because of what I was being paid at that time. But at any rate, we were able to muddle through uh, and to go forward. Well, when I became a member, uh, the president of the PTA, I found out that there was a little difference between the schools here in Fredericksburg, believe it or not. Uh, when James Monroe received new uh, equipment, uh, the one black school, Walker Grant, received new equipment too. It was the cast off of James Monroe. Uh, and so it was new to them, but that was the way things were. And the people uh, who were members said, well, you know, we, we like new things too that are really new. Uh, and so they went to the, to the school board and said that there are some inequities here we need to deal with. Uh, our equipment is not the same, our books are not the same, our class opportunities are not the same. And one of the things that gave them much concern was that youngsters who graduated from high school here uh, could go to the colleges and they would have to take remedial courses because there were courses in high school that they couldn't get here uh, as a part of the regular curriculum. We went to the superintendent and he said, well, we don't have the, our budget does not allow us to give all of these uh, different courses here because there are not enough in, in some classes and we don't have enough for lab work for these others to do. So we have to go forward as we did. Uh, and but the people of the community were not satisfied with that. And they said, well, uh, we've gone to the superintendent, now let's go to the council. Uh, well, let's go first to the school board. The school board was at that time appointed by the council instead of running directly themselves. And so we went to them and they were so kind to us, wonderful people, but they kept telling us no. <laughs> uh, and so uh, the people said, well, we aren't getting anywhere here 
Uh, and so they went to the council, and the council said, you know, we appointed them, and we have to give them the authority to do, and if, they, if we keep interfering with what they're doing, they're going to leave us behind. And so we can't, we can't help you a great deal here. Uh, and so the people said, well, what we need to do then is to get some direct representation on the school board. Uh, and we went uh, after that objective. And we went to the, to the city council. And the council, after some uh, interaction, uh, eventually appointed the first uh, school board member of color. Uh, Mr. Clarence Todd uh, was the first. And Mr. Todd went to the school board and he was able to get some uh, advances made to the point where the people said, well, this is, this is good. So we've got some problems throughout the entire community. So maybe what we need to do, because we've got community places where there are no sidewalks, Annexation took place. They haven't put any sidewalks out here since that time. We don't have the same uh, quality of, of service. And our young people are driving us crazy. They're telling us we don't have anything to do. Dead Fred is killing us. <laughs> and so they said, you, we've got to try to do something for them bring forth some recreational opportunities for them. We've got to make some changes. And we've got to try to improve the quality of our communities. And so they said, well, what we're going to have to do here is to try to get uh, some direct representation on the city council. But before we got to that point, uh, one of the groups, the ministers, as I said, had taken the, the forefront of the effort to bring about desegregation and changes in the community. But there was another group uh, that was already dedicated to bringing about a change. And that group we called, uh, I, we came to know as the Council on Human Relations, uh, the Fredericksburg Council on Human Relations. Uh, and it consisted of moder moderate and liberal uh, whites and college advocates of community, conscious uh, cohesiveness, and cooperation. Uh, Dr. George Van Sand was one of the members of, of that group. Uh, and, but there were others. There was a Dr. Alan Pierce who was on the council for a while. Uh, and there were others, Dr. Um, Robert Shaw, who was the rector of the Trinity uh, Episcopal Church was involved. And it was actually Dr. Shaw who brought me in and got me involved in uh, the, the uh, uh, Mental Health Association uh, at that time and in counseling. And he said, you have, if you're going to get on one, you've got to get into the other. And so uh, Dr. Shaw was at the forefront, and he was uh, a person very much involved. Uh, Dr. Clyde Carter, who was at the Presbyterian Church, I remember, uh, having a role. Uh, and of course, Reverend Bill Huff, some of you may remember Reverend Huff. Uh, and of course, uh, there was a lady from the college, Ms. Susie Peach Foster. Uh, who was very active and direct uh, and effective. Uh, and so uh, with these persons on the Council on Human Relations, uh, that group made a difference uh, in, in, in this community. And as I said, there was a heavy presence of professors and students from Mary Washington College uh, at that time. Uh, and uh, as a result of their efforts, uh, changes came. Now, the one change that perhaps the, all, the entire community might remember is uh, 
the fact that the Human Relations Council was involved in trying to bring about fair uh, and affordable housing uh, in, in the city of Fredericksburg. Uh, and after the Dr. King's assassination, they really went to work uh, and brought about the change. And the fact, uh, the matter is that not much is said about it, but the second fair housing uh, uh, initiative in the state of Virginia was passed here in Fredericksburg. Uh, and as a result of their efforts, the first subsidized housing uh, uh, in, in, the, in, in the city of Fredericksburg came about, it's Hazel Hill. Uh, and uh, Hazel Hill was the second subsidized housing project in the state of Virginia. Uh, and so it was the Council on Human Relations that had a very great impact on bringing these things about. One of the persons, you know, I, I know I'm gonna get, I, getting myself in, in trouble calling names, but person, one person who I remember being uh, a leader uh, in that Council on Human Relations was Mrs. Rebecca Reed, who at one point uh, became a member of the Board of Supervisors uh, in Stafford County. And her husband, Dr. Reed, was brought out, he finished college and the local mental health association brought him here to be director of the mental health clinic uh, here in Fredericksburg. And so these were people, these were the kinds of people, people simply of goodwill. And this is what has been the source of strength for Fredericksburg down through the years, that people of goodwill were willing to come together to make the personal sacrifice of popularity that was necessary uh, and work together to bring about the changes that took place as a result of their efforts. And I might indicate to you that Fredericksburg did not, at the time of Dr. King's assassination, undergo the same kind of Un unrest and upheaval uh, that took place in other communities across the nation. There were riot, there was rioting, uh, there was upheaval, uh, there were uh, people who were getting in all kinds of trouble and doing all kinds of destructive things, but it didn't happen here in Fredericksburg. And that's because we had people here of goodwill not everybody was of the same mind, but we had a core of good people on both, on, in both races who were willing to come together to try to work together in a positive way uh, to bring about the changes that were necessary. And as a result of those changes, we, we, we came to establish a biracial commission. Uh, and through that biracial commission, uh, we finally opened up public accommodations uh, in this area. Uh, I'm gonna do some cutting off here. Uh, okay, in terms of progressive human rights, uh, we found out that after the students had been in the schools for a while, uh, they had re resegregated themselves. Uh, and there was some concern as to why this was happening. Well, it was twofold. Some of the students themselves said that when they left the black schools, they also left uh, an atmosphere of concern uh, and support. Uh, the teachers in the black schools took a personal interest, because this was a, a small community, they took a personal interest in the students. And they came to know the students' families. And uh, they were not beyond going to the students' home after school to see that the family know, knew what the student was doing or not doing 
And they would get the support of the family in terms of dealing with these students. And so uh, this was uh, a culture where they, the students knew that they were caught up in this situation. There was no way out. Uh, even I, it came close to a church and, and state situation where, for example, if a church had uh, a youth week coming up, the students at the public school stayed after school to rehearse and to become uh, prepared uh, for this. And all of them went to the same churches for, uh, even though they belonged to different churches, went to the same church for these special occasions. And so it was a sense of cohesiveness and, and camaraderie that had developed uh, as they came together at the school. But when they left that school system, that school, uh, they left the concern of the teachers in many cases behind uh, because what they said was that when they went to the quote white schools the teachers there only tolerated them uh, they didn't make any contact with their families uh, they barely made contact with them and they had the feeling that what they were trying to do is the teachers wanted to get them out as soon as they could. So they would pass them through. And if there were behavioral problems, that they would put them over in special ed uh, so that they would have, not have to deal with them in a regular classroom. Uh, and so as a result of that, uh, they felt isolated uh, within a desegregated situation. And so they sought comfort and strength for themselves, and so they resegregated themselves in a desegregated situation for being able to, to go forward. Uh, this eased up after a while, and, and, and things began to get better, but it took a little time for them to get to this point. Uh, now, I'll skip along, because I know you're getting, I, I know you, you've done a wonderful job. All of you are still away. <laughs> and I won't, I won't burden you much longer. Uh, another, well, I talked about the, uh, the Council on Human Relations. And I, I hope that I've gotten across to you the fact that there was no rioting, no upheaval here, because we had people of goodwill of both races who were willing to work together to get changes that took place. The changes took place. Uh, I, told, I told you about the biracial commission. They worked diligently. Uh, and those persons on the council and the chamber of commerce uh, worked diligently also. One of the motivations there, I, I don't know that I've said this publicly before, was the fact that Fredericksburg is a tourist attract. Our number one industry for many years was tourism. It's not now. I think uh, retail may be our number one industry at this point. But at that point, tourism was. And they, the council said, you know, We've got to attract people in here. Uh, and so we don't want a town where there's upheaval and unrest because nobody's coming in uh, to do the tourism uh, if, this is, this is, if this is what they're going into. And so they worked behind the scenes along with the Biracial Commission to bring about the opening of these facilities, uh, public accommodations, so that we would have the, the uh, situation that we have. Uh, now, uh, I'll, I'll skip ahead. Uh, later groups, uh, latter groups, formed to advance the cause of civil rights included FACRO. I can't remember what this is the anonym for FACRO. Uh, at any rate, 
FACRO was born because at one point, uh, and I think it was uh, after the assassination of Dr. King and uh, a few years had passed by, uh, and Nightline uh, had decided to come into Fredericksburg. Nightline was a very popular uh, late night program at that time. And they decided that they wanted to show the change and the progress that had taken place uh, since the assassination of Dr. King. Uh, and they would come to Fredericksburg and they would interview the people and they would show people across the nation what Fredericksburg had done in the way of progress. Well, it didn't quite work out that way. Uh, they interviewed some people at a local pharmacy whose name I will not repeat here. And what happened was, in, in those interviews, and not only in that pharmacy, but I guess maybe outside too, uh, they found out that, uh, unfortunately, that there was a revelation of a lingering attitude that would not uh, affect the kind of change that they thought had taken place here. Uh, and people within the city were a bit disturbed because uh, what came out was not positive for Fredericksburg at that time. And so in order to try to get back on track uh, and to get the people back on uh, into a position of wanting to work together for the improvement of the community, FACRO uh, was created. And as I said, now, now Dr. Mr. Johnny P. Johnson, the, uh, the uh, artist who created these, what I call masterpieces, uh, was the first president of FACRO. Uh, and again, there was a group of, these were a group of people from both sides of the racial divide who were coming together uh, to, to make a difference, a positive difference. Uh, and subsequent to that, uh, after he left as president, uh, another name that you might recognize uh, is Ms. Jeanette Rowe Cadwalenda. Her husband is the publisher of the Freelance Star. He, she was a leader of FACRO for a while. Uh, and so these were means by which people in the community continued to try to move forward. Now the most recent one, and I'm going to end with this, is more and more is, uh, is spearheaded by Ms. Susan Spears, who is the president of the uh, of the uh, Chamber of Commerce. I can't remember what more is all about. <laughs> that multicultural is, is as far as I can get with that. Uh, but they have what I call a bureau. It's not a mural, though. What, what is it? Mosaic, right, thank you. A mosaic uh, in the city uh, that reflects uh, their desire for cooperation between diverse, uh, diverse groups uh, and to bring about a spirit of community and cooperation. Uh, and it's on, is it Jackson Street? Yeah. Right, okay. So uh, they, they, they are still involved and on every uh, Martin Luther King birthday or birthday celebration, uh, they have a program uh, which is an attempt to bring the community together to bring about an appreciation for uh, past efforts towards civil justice uh, and civil rights, uh, and they are still involved in bringing diverse groups and diverse uh, ideas together. Thank you for putting up with me for all of this time, and I'm going to stop here. <laughs>